I'm going to read a couple of passages from the book. It'll take about uh, 13 minutes, uh, after which I'm eager to continue the conversation and maybe uh, answer some questions of yours. Um, there are slides that uh, loosely relate to what I'm reading, and we'll just sort of breeze through those, but I thought it'd be nice to have some visual anchors for some of this material. Um, I guess three different passages. The first is from the introduction. This is a little bit more literary critical. I want to say a word uh, about the qualities of Hex poems, and then I'll read two passages from the life which are more narrative. Hecht would never write confessional poems like his friends or colleagues W.D. Snodgrass, Robert Lowell, Sylvia Plath, and Anne Sexton. Quote, I work at disguising the autobiographical, he told one reporter. What I hope to do, he told another, is to conceal my identity by putting it into a whole cast of characters in which the reader can't tell who the real Anthony Hecht is. He saw how Robert Frost and Wallace Stevens, quote, contrived to deal with very personal, sometimes emotionally devastating matters in their poetry. In Frost's case, this is well recognized, even when he took certain precautions. Hecht was, quote, urged by the same sort of tact and discretion to avoid raw disclosure. A slight scuffing of the surface, however, reveals the searingly personal. Quote, there are, after all, poets like Frost whose poems are remarkably intimate once you crack their codes. Like Frost, Hecht became a poet with a key. In his poems, quote, a bleak and forlorn landscape could assemble and convey a deep sense of despair. Into seemingly offhand images, Hecht could encode the carnage of war. Death the Whore, for example, unfolds beneath a sky of German silver, a column of smoke rising. Still life ends abruptly with an act of re-experiencing typical of post-traumatic stress. The speaker is transported in an instant from a peaceful, natural setting to standing, quote, somewhere in Germany, cold, wet, garand rifle in my hands. Several autobiographical undercurrents animate the Venetian Vespers, including a father's mysterious disappearance. Hecht understood the complex connections between a poet's life and work. His lengthy appreciation of Auden, pictured here, um, Hecht is cracking Auden up by reciting dirty limericks. Um, they were on a program at the 92nd Street Y uh, of light verse. And uh, Heck knew Auden from Italy, where they uh, uh, got to know each other on the island of Ischia um, about, uh, about 15 years before this. Uh, his lengthy appreciation of Auden, which came pouring out of him after his retirement from teaching, led him to the conclusion that, quote, it may ultimately be impossible to pluck out the core of the mystery of any man after his death. But Hecht, like Frost before him, left clues. They are there, often beneath a layer of leaves and twigs in the damp landscapes of his poems. His life holds essential keys. Turning them opens realms at once impersonal in the sense that T.S. Eliot praised and deeply felt. Hecht never broadcast his pain, nor did he succumb to it. Writing poetry brought him joy. After long suffering came a reversal, almost as an act of grace, and the poems tell this story too. No poet of the 20th century has better expressed the trauma to the American psyche caused by the Second World War a horror deepened by his experience of his own German-Jewish heritage, as well as the bitter legacy of anti-Semitism he encountered in his youth. No American poet has expressed such traumas so exquisitely, steeped in the language of Shakespeare and the Bible, and fluent in the fine arts of painting, music, and drama. His poems are an indelible record of suffering and joy 
darkness and light.